So Systems Change Finland uh, trying to you know, spread the word about our systems thinking and, and uh, the methods and, and practices that it um, uses to, to advance systems change in society. Okay, uh, to kick off today's event, uh, we thought it would make sense to, to very quickly recap uh, reductionism and systems thinking and the difference between them, uh, how reductionism helps to, to break anything into its known or, or yet to be named uh, parts, but it doesn't help with interpreting anything that is unstructured. So it's concerned with doing careful, uh, carefully controlled experiments, looking at uh, yeah, details, one factor at a time, etc. While holism or systems thinking is uh, positing that the parts of the whole are intimately interconnected and cannot be understood without uh, referencing uh, the whole. Uh, if I want to, to bring a little uh, example from my own background, which is learning sciences, then I would say, imagine taking a kid or adult for that matter, uh, putting them in a lab, putting all sorts of things on their heads that reads the, the psychological or physi physiological science of the brain, etc., versus uh, having that person in the actual classroom, sitting to some next to someone who they like or dislike, taking into account whether they're whether they are uh, involved in in the kids' education or not, or whether you are choosing a profession that has monetary value in today's economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but we have also this distinction in in the climate. Uh, debate, like the, the reductionist school of thought sees climate change as resulting simply from a technical problem of um, carbon emissions. And if we are thinking about the problem this way, then it brings us to solutions that are purely technical in nature, such as carbon capture, uh, energy efficiency, nuclear energy, and like. While a holistic view of climate change uh, starts by understanding that it's related to a whole um, complex uh, reality of disorders that, that are present in our, our global ecosystem, uh, like uh, desertification, the biodiversity loss, uh, oceans acidification, uh, soil degradation, and, and all that. Uh, and we, which probably all come from uh, directly or indirectly uh, from the fact that human pop population is growing and economies are expanding and uh, fuel, uh, fossil fuel use is ever increasing. Uh, so yeah, both reductionist and, and systemic thinking has, it mer has its merits in, in understanding and learning uh, about the world. Uh, the problems arise if we think or use one or the other exclusively or we misuse them. And so that's why I'm really glad uh, that Tom joined us because he's one of the best people to, to talk about how to actually do it right. So uh, introducing our, our speaker, Tom Boschhardt uh, from the Netherlands. He is the founder and director of Accept, who is, which is um, an innovation and, and consultancy company. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I am a, a huge fan of organizations that uh, promote and support uh, systems thinking, systems analysis, and systemic change. So I'm very happy to be here and honored to be invited. Uh, my name is Tom Boschaert. You can also say Boschaert if that guttural Dutch sound doesn't agree with you very well. Um, and I am uh, originally an industrial design engineer. That was my first study in uh, Delft University. And during which, uh, when I was 19 years old, I founded Accept Integrated Sustainability with the idea that uh, what I was trying to do is trying to find innovative solutions that help uh, large groups of people within society and very quickly during my, uh, my degree, which is already quite a multidisciplinary faceted uh, degree, is industrial design, uh, I quickly discovered that, that just from that, I would say, closed quarters multidisciplinarity 
uh, we're not going to be able to touch uh, remotely the complexities of uh, potential solutions to uh, to address the problems of society. They are endemic, systemic. So we need fundamental research, we need business development, we need uh, economics, sociology, we need uh, ecology. And that's when I started developing uh, the first ideas of a framework that would help me as an individual and later on me with my organization to find fundamental solutions for, for the problems that we face uh, living on this planet. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the methodology that I've developed. I'm going to go quite quickly over a little bit introduction of who we are as an organization. And then later on, after the break, I will show you a few of the projects that we were able to do, uh, which I think, uh, I hope inspire you. And um, uh, yeah, uh, so let's get started. So Accept is a certified B Corp something that we uh, uh, are uh, looking for is to look at the underlying patterns um, of society that have both created where we are now and that are still dry the driving force uh, behind uh, humanity's uh, uh, approach towards uh, facing all kinds of complex difficulties in this 21st century um, in a way you know uh, trying to prevent war because uh, many of these uh, tensions will eventually erupt like an earthquake or a volcano in uh, human conflict. One of the important ones is, of course, unbalanced resource control, uh, which has on one side, of course, the availability of resources, uh, as well as the demand of resources. And that has something to do with things like uh, circular economy and how we distribute them. But it also very much has to do with policy uh, um, uh, business and, uh, and organizational frameworks, and as well, of course, uh, with uh, social justice and how things are distributed. So even if you just start from something like, okay, energy, then you, if you really delve deeper into it from a systemic perspective, you're going to encounter all of these uh, aspects. So uh, the question is, uh, how do we deal with that? Uh, we have, of course, the uh, planetary boundaries, which are something uh, very fundamental that we have to deal with, where we have uh, crossed the boundary of biodiversity loss, climate change, and uh, nitrogen extraction already quite substantially. And then there are some others that we need to uh, keep in mind. And that's just the, uh, the very beginning of the, the hard, cold uh, physics behind living on this, uh, this planet. I'm just going to keep clicking admit every now and then, if that's all right, uh, to people in the waiting room. Um, yeah, so uh, there are all of these uh, uh, interrelated uh, aspects of, um, of the challenges that we deal with. And every part is a facet of the other. So things like infrastructure and uh, um, technical challenges in, in resource availability and, and pollution they are an aspect of the social patterns that we've created for ourselves of separating um, uh, work and living of uh, certain uh, population densities that we've created or separations from our ecological connectivity and the way that we have built our cities and our living environments to be kind of uh, um, completely separated from the realities of uh, that which we literally rely on is the air we breathe, the water we drink, and all of the biological systems that we rely on to nourish ourselves and to also create happiness and well-being. And instead, we just throw it out, of course, and uh, decide to soil our own mattress. So this is a fundamental question. How do we flourish in this rapidly changing world? which is a different question from how do we prevent the worst or how do we reduce the bad stuff? We and me from a philosophical perspective, also having worked for a bit over 20 years in this, just focusing on the, the bad side and not understanding also that there's such a beautiful positive side on the other side of it, uh, is very important for, for my, my own health, for your own health to make sure that you can keep doing this decade after decade and try to face with the reality, the complexity of the problems that we're, uh, that we're uh, dealing with. 
but also truly hoping for that beautiful future that we do have and to uh, always be able to, uh, to take those two along. So we're always trying to face the reality by saying we're not going to do less bad and we're trying to do more good. And it becomes a little bit of a trivial thing to say, but it really does change your direction and your strategy if you really try to understand what that means with each uh, and every project. So accept integrated sustainability. Uh, what we do is we do consulting, uh, we do innovation, which means that uh, we formulate our own projects, we try to find funding for it, and uh, then promote solutions that we feel that no one is yet asking for. So we learn uh, by working all over the world uh, by advising people, but then we also eat our own medicine by investing uh, and developing our own projects. Um, so it's been about yeah, 22 year, years now, I believe. We work uh, um, on places, uh, cities uh, and, and uh, uh, living environments. We work on, on business and helping organizations to, uh, to deal with the transition towards sustainable economy. And with all of our uh, projects, we try to include ecosystem services and using ecology to power uh, solutions for the long term, rather than just relying on technical uh, aspects, because everything that we do to support the uh, uh, ecological processes will have added benefits uh, down, down the line. So this is also an important one to make us go from dreaming uh, to an actual realization. So that's something that we definitely do. We try to make these projects a reality. And that's what's uh, going to be shown in the project's uh, examples later on, that we are uh, just uh, having an, a good idea is, uh, is valuable, but it's not good enough. Uh, you learn by doing, and many of the complicated issues that we're facing are not so much with the primary idea or having a technical solution, but how do we implement that at scale uh, to the benefit of mankind and actually make it work in the complexity of our reality. So we do research and analysis. Uh, we develop strategies and concepts to design and engineering and the project management that lies behind it in the areas of the cities and environments, organizations, industry, food production. And we uh, provide training and knowledge, also free video courses and expert courses online. Uh, as well as books and, and, and lectures and so on. So our organization, uh, this is an important one. It's this multidisciplinary collaboration between team of scientists and researchers, a team of designers and engineers, and a team of uh, business managers and uh, uh, people who do process management and involving stakeholders. And with every project, we make sure that there's someone from those teams uh, present. We are a reasonably small team with about 15 people. And that's also something that works to keep connectivity short and to have no hierarchy within the organization and to continue to have that personal involvement that is so very important when you're trying to uh, run these complex innovation projects. Um, and in that process, we do work with organizations from very small local agencies to large international uh, companies like IKEA or Heineken or big NGOs uh, and having all of those different facets and being able to engage those different stakeholders, including governmental, NGOs, funders, technical agencies, and so on, is an important skill to be the glue within the complex network on helping to uh, uh, support taking the next step forward. So this is about um, where our projects are. They are quite distributed uh, in the world. Uh, and that's also a learning experience, also that diversity in uh, both the backgrounds of our team members. I believe we speak nine or 10 different languages uh, among the 15 people that we have, but also our work distributed along geographies teaches us solutions from one place to embed in another. And within that, all the organizational uh, um, uh, challenges that we face from policy to uh, food systems, energy, supply chains and so on, everything that you will encounter once dealing with systemic sustainability. And sometimes people ask, so what is it that you do exactly? Because it's not the topic that is binding us or the discipline, but it is uh, the approach and the ambition and the, the goal, which is uh, systemic long-term transformation. 
which as you may understand 20 years ago was very difficult to explain and I'm very happy that now there are more and more people engaged in this uh, a way of approaching it. It's basically a process and worldview based organization rather than one that is uh, uh, just hiring engineers to do engineering because engineering in itself is simply a, 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 a method to, uh, to try to achieve something, but what is it that you're trying to achieve? So I'll give you a short um, summary of the symbiosis in development framework, which I think you may be most interested in. Um, the symbiosis in development framework is a systems thinking, a systemic sustainability framework from beginning to end. Uh, I don't know if you can see me in the view. I have the book here, which is the first omnibus book uh, that was produced over a period of 10 years. There's also a, a shorter quick guide available. This book is uh, freely downloadable and open source from the website. So I'm sorry for the promotion, but it is free. And uh, the whole intent of it is to broaden the uh, literacy about systemic sustainability to give us a, a language to share and a structure for us to connect with when we talk about things like resilience or uh, systemic analysis or uh, uh, feedback systems, uh, causal loop diagrams, you name it, all the stuff that comes along to give you one place where you can get started, whether or not you're beginning or you're already a bit more advanced, to get that glue for us all to be able to cooperate and, uh, uh, and work forward. Uh, it's not a rigid framework. It uh, allows lots of place to include your own tools, um, but it does create that shared language. And that's where I uh, would like to start because of course there are so many different frameworks now uh, that you can get lost. You know, you can get lost in uh, focusing entirely on circularity, for example, which is an important aspect, you know, of our, 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 our going forward. And there's a huge support of that within uh, Europe uh, specifically. Uh, but uh, what about social justice? A circular system is not necessarily a just system. Also, a circular system is not necessarily a resilient system. In fact, some circular systems are far more brittle and, uh, and, and less resilient than, than some others are. So is that necessarily a step forward? So we feel that uh, we need to have an eye on these major important aspects to keep them in mind when we are working on these kinds of projects to make sure that we're not making the same mistake as we have been doing so often um, during the past uh, century of thinking that we're making a step forward, but actually we are uh, taking two steps back. So symbiosis in development consists of three, uh, there are three aspects that really glue it together. Uh, first of all, is whole systems thinking and systems analysis. Then there is the integrated or holistic approach, which are not the same. I'll get into that in a minute. And co-creation, which also means the involvement of stakeholders all along the process, which is another form of integration, if you will. So systems analysis, systems thinking, we often use these graphical maps to be able to deal with the complexity. Uh, graphics can contain more information and people have a very good mental system for unraveling visual uh, visual complexity. So that those are great tools that we use. Uh, they don't always look like this. It can also be a spreadsheet or just a bullet point list, uh, whatever works. Uh, but uh, we encourage people to explore visually because it's such a rich medium um, uh, to do. Um, in that, we use systems diagrams. This is an example of a systems diagram, uh, a diagram being kind of an artificial perspective on reality that helps us to organize things, to try to make something a little bit less messy from the world that is infinitely messy. And this is definitely a reductionist approach, as Dora was just uh, saying. The, the point is, and I'll get to that in a minute, that you combine this with a complexity approach rather than saying reductionist is bad and complexity is good. It is, no, both both solutions, because they are solutions to dealing with the world around us, they have something to offer. So we do both at the same time and try to see where they reach each other to try to complement each other in that process. So there's a typical thing of a diagram, which is definitely reductionist, 
but then we use the inventory of creating such a diagram to indicate, for example, what exactly is important and what do we think is less important. And then we start using them as a form of mapping. And the mapping is a way to rise above the simplicity of that reduction, reductionist nature, start looking at uh, feedback systems and start building our understanding of the complexity of the system, which is always messy. And you can never make it into an ideal diagram. And this is where things like causal loop mapping um, uh, and other kinds of mapping in time, mapping in context, and, and also spatial mapping, they come into our toolbox. And uh, we have described within the SID framework many different ways of doing this. So if you're uh, a beginner at system mapping, then, then, then that would be a good resource for you to, uh, to investigate. Um, the integrated approach means that we try to look at all relevant aspects at the same time. It means that, for example, when we look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, when you do a project, sometimes you see, okay, we have chosen uh, to focus on number three, good health and well-being. The thing is, if you do things in number three, you're going to affect all the other ones at the same time. When you do an energy project, you will undoubtedly be touching on water problems, social justice, and long-term resilience. You know, it, they, these are not separable. And uh, reducing it to each one of these individual items or whatever subject matter that, that has been chosen based on kind of an object-oriented theme, they will, they will basically um, blind you to the effects of what you will be doing with, within the system of society in the long run. And that's the mistake that we've been making all through the last you know, 150, 200 years of our industrial revolution and development. So that's what we need to uh, avoid. And this, the interesting thing about this, this is a lot, but it is not that hard. So that's a really important thing to do. And that's usually with systems analysis is that if you're trying to break your brain because it's super complicated, then you need to not simplify it, but you need to find a way to go through the motions and do the work. And that's a, a, an interesting thing about symbiosis in development is that it creates a, a structural framework for you to go through it step by step Without, uh, without hurting to keep everything up into your mind, but to be able to, uh, to have a complete overview without defining what that completeness is. And that's you know, also an interesting one we can get into in a bit. Last but not least, very important, co-creation between multiple stakeholders. And I'm not just talking about getting three uh, university uh, level uh, uh, people from different departments together. It's also about really involving people on the ground, people from different cultures, people from totally different demographics to really expand the capacity for uh, human understanding to go beyond the individuals that just happen to have uh, that challenge in, uh, in front of them. And you will see you will get so many unexpected uh, solutions when you just diversify uh, the team that you are going through these processes with. We've defined a couple of, um, of approaches. Usually the sessions that we do, they require some preparation time that I will get into uh, and, and do these sessions. They last from one afternoon to four or five day sessions in a row. Uh, that's about uh, the scope and uh, the way that they are activated and the way that we do them are described uh, in, in, the, in the book. So the purpose of this is to go towards a systemic transition towards resilient sustainability, um, using complex dynamics uh, and making sure that everybody understands what they are. A root cause analysis, for those of you that know, is integrated stakeholder uh, management using these processes, uh, having sharp goal setting, KPI reporting be included because that's important for a lot of organizations to include process management, who's responsible for the process and leads it along, who are the two members, what are their responsibilities, uh, to make sure that we go into iterative cycles. So that means that you're not working linearly from uh, question to answer, but you revisit each time to be able to include another layer of complexity as you go along. And that's one effective way of dealing with the complexities uh, around us. And here also what Dora uh, showed, you know, is the reductionist thinking 
versus the complexity thinking and to have both of those two boxes side by side and be able to understand how you can go from one to the other, what value one can bring to the other and how together they can empower your ambition of trying to create systemic uh, changes within so uh, society. So the reductionist piece by piece number based thinking, which is incredibly important for us has brought us to the moon, you know, with our uh, mechanical engineering and, uh, and uh, uh, practical science, while at the same time, complex systems thinking, the unpredictability, the fact that you cannot predict what happens and looking at it much more from an organic perspective, a psychological perspective, uh, a perspective that has a certain mysticism to it because it's infinitely complex, but also so very beautiful in its nature. And to understand that that is actually the reality of it. And that is much more about pattern recognition and understanding the underlying uh, behaviors like learning the behavior of another creature of, of a biological entity than it is about being able to predict or analyze or pull it apart and understanding how the, uh, the interactions work between the parts. So um, Dora, how much time do you have left? Um, you have a minute. Great. Well then, <laughs> I don't have enough time. Um, so there is a definition of sustainability within the SID framework. We found it very important to do this because the United Nations definition of sustainability, which says that we should uh, uh, not do things that prevent future generations from uh, serving their own needs, is a great goal, but it's not a definition. It doesn't say what it actually is. Uh, so we have worked for many years on getting onto this. This is version four and has been staying stable for about 10 years or so. That sustainability is the state of a complex dynamic system. And that in this state, that means that sustainability is a property of our society and not necessarily of a book or a tree or a car. Basically means that a sustainable car doesn't work. It's not a complex system. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't make sense. So it is about how the car contributes or detracts from the sustainability of that system. That's what we're looking at. And um, in that defining that uh, in that state, the system is resilient, meaning that it can withstand unexpected uh, uh, situations that change its state. Uh, um, things that we cannot predict could be natural events, could be societal events, whatever it is for it to be able to return to a healthy state, that it is in harmony, which means that the people inside and the agents are not going to fight each other because things are uh, just and also requiring uh, not requiring inputs from outside the system boundaries, which has to do with autonomy, with circularity. So it's these three aspects, resilience, autonomy and harmony, and within that play field, interfacing with each other trying to reach a place of sustainability, which is a dynamic process, something that is sustainable, changes over time and uh, is a very dynamic process. So it's not a rigid, hard weaponing against the future, but it is a more of an elegant uh, flow of something that changes continuously and that makes it infinitely interesting and fascinating at the same time. I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit further, Dora, but uh, I think this is important. No problem. Yes, it is indeed, so carry on. So this is a part of the theoretical part of the SID framework, besides uh, the, the method and the process and all the tools that are in it. Main uh, aspect on the system level, we're talking about the properties of resilience, autonomy and harmony. Then we have a bunch of network parameters that I'll show you in a minute. And then we have the object level, which is everything you can point to within, uh, within our reality, starting at the basis from energy, uh, building up uh, to materials and so on. So this bottom stack, which often you go in this stack from the bottom to the top to create understanding. Because going from the top down, which is also interesting, that's where you do the pattern recognition. Your complexity analysis is top down while your reductionist approach is bottom up. So here somewhere in the middle, they meet, 
which is often in those network parameters, which is very interesting to see how they have a double function. So we have energy materials, then within and part of all those energy materials are our ecosystems and species. There are a subset of this, and that's why they're stacked on top of each other. Our economy and culture, our society is a subset of these economy and species, and each individual and their health and happiness is a subset of the economy, of the culture, of species and ecosystems. So this is a relational stack where you can see that anything that goes wrong in the bottom will automatically find its way up. So there's a causal uh, a relationship between all of these layers. This is also an extremely useful tool to do brainstorming and put post-its on to make sure within a short amount of time that your team has had a, a view on these different aspects uh, that are related to our reality. Then from that, we try to build them up towards these uh, systemic parameters. And I'm just going to skip these. Uh, and here you can see the network level unfolded with uh, a bunch of network parameters. There are others and there's more and you can change them, but this is a universal set. For example, um, resilience can be broken down into aspects such as flexibility, connectivity, uh, diversity, uh, centrality, and so on. And from a bottom-up perspective, you can actually do this numerically, which means that you are quantifying what you are defining as resilience within your network and you can build a, a KPI on it. But on a top-down perspective from a complexity analysis, you can use them as a singular uh, behavioral perspective. What does connectivity mean within the complex system that I'm interacting with right now? What is awareness? And then you can feed it back. Let's say, look at awareness, on an individual's happiness or awareness of uh, species within an ecosystem. So you can cross pollinate these and start to explore and be very creative in that approach towards complexity analysis, which is necessary because there's infinite amounts of things to research. So you need some kind of guide that allow you to not understand everything because you will never do that, but for you to be able to almost like Take it and look at it from these different sides so that you can start to see behaviors and patterns that may be beneficial or that may be dangerous towards uh, the goal that you have within in your project. So autonomy, uh, circularity was already mentioned is an important part of being able to take care of oneself, but also self-governance and things like uh, network support, taking care of other systems that are outside of ourselves. And of course, the harmony parameters that has a lot to do with things like social justice, but not just for people, also inclusion, inclusion of animals, for example, within uh, our rights, you know, uh, mistreating animals within a lot of cultures is illegal, which is an inclusion aspect of animals within our uh, uh, harmony frameworks. So uh, these are uh, very interesting. And again, you can also quantify these, measure them. Uh, while at the same time you can use them for pattern recognition. So um, let's just look at one quick example of, let's say, the interaction between efficiency and redundancy. So when we're looking at and, and, and trying to cross-pollinate this in, in a creative process, you very quickly can find these uh, interrelationships within uh, uh, a, a societal system. So typically, when you increase efficiency of a system, you increase autonomy because autonomy, efficiency is an aspect of autonomy. Let's say uh, you uh, uh, cut uh, very efficiently so that you uh, have exactly the right resources that you need in order to operate. That's very efficient. And a lot of our, uh, especially Western, but global commercial projects are, are geared towards, it needs to be as efficient as possible. The problem with that is that it almost always reduces redundancy because redundancy, having more of the same thing is often inefficient. You're paying for multiple while you could make do with one. So why would you want to have that? The problem with reducing redundancy is that it decreases resilience because if that one thing that you have breaks down or is uh, um, disabled for whatever purpose or is affected, then well, your system will stop. And that means it has broken through its resilience. 
So efficiency and redundancy are fighting each other, which means that autonomy and resilience are not always in balance. In fact, they're often, you're trying to find a balance between them rather than maximizing all of them. And these kinds of little exercises, they are, are great to understand within the systems that you're looking at, what are the interrelationships between them and how can we talk about it with our team? What labels do we stick on it? How do we define it? And therefore, how, uh, how can we find a process together to find tangible solutions within a certain period of time and provide uh, a better solution than just uh, doing it uh, the normal way? Uh, so a typical example of redundancy and efficiency has been a very nice example, of course, very current with Corona, where Germany has 32 intensive care beds per 100,000 inhabitants before Corona started. And the Netherlands has eight in, uh, um, intensive care beds, which is typical Dutch efficiency. The Dutch are very happy to be efficient, whereas Germany has a different perspective on healthcare. Whereas having more of it, while Germans, of course, are usually also very efficient, their healthcare is one of those places where they are happy to have redundancy. Now, something unexpected happens, and the result is, uh, yeah, first of all, the OECD in 2019 criticized Germany for being inefficient. Now, just a while later, Corona breaks out, Germany does fine, and is actually providing intensive care beds to the Netherlands which is actually an example of network uh, support. So you see how these things are uh, uh, in interplay with every news article that you, uh, that you read. So um, I'm going to skip here. Uh, these are just some examples of being able to do quick scans. There are lots of examples in the book. And then there are examples on how you do this with a team. Here you can see uh, Heineken working on its circularity program, about 18 people in a room for three days, walking through this analysis and then creating a shared understanding of how these patterns work. Uh, it's also creative. Here's the director of Schiphol Airport that we make drawing hearts. As part of the process of understanding this, uh, seemingly childlike, but actually working in that creative way is so very important and not to get stuck behind a screen or a screen uh, or, or a spreadsheet and to have that interaction. So, um, from project management perspective, uh, there are these different phases that you can use with the different parts, almost like a modular system that you can click together and then work on a project from about, let's say, a couple of days to projects that last for years. And after the break, I'm going to show you um, uh, what the results are of some of those projects. And here you can see typically that we tend to design and develop projects that are mostly roadmaps. So they are not a singular solution in time. They are an, something that evolves and continuously tries to poke the uh, complex system in order to start moving into its transition. Transition maps are another great way to do that, uh, which are also covered. So uh, yeah, last but not least, again, the book is free. There's a lot of free tools. You can find everything on thinksit.org. Please spread uh, the words. You can also order the book physically if you want to, uh, but uh, yeah, the PDF has everything in it as well and allows you to search for things, which is useful. Um, yeah, we're gonna stick here and then um, giving it back to you, Dora. Oh, that was fast enough. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm sure you could speak about this for, I don't know, days and days. Um, we are a bit short on time, but we are being a bit flexible now with our, our timeline that we initially planned. So uh, if it's okay with you, Tom, I will just ask like a couple of questions that came up, the easier ones for now, and then we can carry on with the examples, if that's sure. okay. Okay, so Shinad, if I pronounce your name correctly, I uh, was asking if you could provide an example for a, for a less brittle circular system. You were mentioning that some are more than, more than others. Mm -hmm. do, you have any, do you have any examples of, of what would be a less brittle circular system? A less brittle circular system? You mean a resilient uh, circular system? I'm not sure. So now so, do you want to jump uh, in? Yeah, I mean, uh, when you look at circularity, for example, something that will 
uh, and if you look at the network parameters, right, increasing connectivity is not necessarily a good idea. Every connection has a cost. And each connection, I mean, typically we consider connectivity to be a great thing, right? Like, like connectivity, we try to promote connectivity and so on. And then Corona breaks out and we have to reduce connectivity drastically between people to stop the, uh, uh, the transfer of the disease. So what allows us to do that is flexibility. So here you can see kind of a cross pollination between being flexible in your connectivity. So yes, you're connected and that's usually great, but at certain points it is not. And so that's allowing you to be flexible. Now there's quite a lot of circular systems that are not flexible because they are so reliant on, you have to do it like this and then you have to do it like that. It has to go through that one and you have 20 steps in that circle Whereas, for example, using a bio-based system that isn't particularly circular within the mechanical uh, uh, way of, of, of looking at it, it's just it's taking something and then putting it back in the form of fertilizer. Now, it's unpopular to say that, you know, um, that that may be a less uh, circular system, but it's definitely less circular from a human perspective. So it's more bio-based in, in, in that sense. And then you can, of course, go towards having a highly mechanical circular system uh, that is just simply detrimental, that has all kinds of side effects that uh, exclude people, uh, that is brittle, uh, that is um, uh, inefficient, that um, maybe even like an uh, uh, interesting thing, I have this beautiful bag made out of um, tires from bicycles. Mm -hmm. Now the company that did it, they used to collect old bicycle tires and that's how they made the bags. But then the bags became very popular and they ran out of old bicycle tires. So then because it at some point became a commercial company, uh, very popular because of circularity and it is in a way a circular system in that sense. Um, yeah, they started new, using new bicycle tires because they didn't have them anymore. And that meant that producing bicycle tires is very uh, environmentally unfriendly. It's vulcanized rubber, which is almost the worst material you can imagine to make a bag, you know, just make a bag out of something else. But because you've locked yourself into that circular system, it's inflexible and you weren't able to adapt uh, it uh, towards uh, different means. And that means that you locked yourself into the material cycle rather than looking at what the complexity of the network might be doing, uh, you end up with something worse than the solution that you uh, actually presented. So it's that sort of stuff. Great, thank you. Um, okay, because I'm just conscious of time, let's carry on with the, with the projects. I think a lot of people are interested to, to hear about those. Uh, and then we can continue once you are uh, finished and continue with the questions afterwards. Great, all right. Let's talk about some of the projects which might uh, inspire you a bit. I think uh, I will uh, share my screen again. I think that's useful. Uh, here we go. Yeah, you can see this. This is uh, one of the first projects that we started. It's uh, one of my darlings, uh, the San Francisco Transbase Center, which has been renamed into Salesforce Park. Uh, our challenge here was we had an old bus station in the middle of downtown San Francisco, a big concrete old block. And if you can see from this uh, bird's eye view, there's really not much going on in terms of ecosystems of biodiversity within the city, struggling with the urban heat island effect, uh, with uh, stormwater drainage, uh, huge infrastructural costs, uh, dealing with increased waterfall, and uh, the city had challenged uh, yeah, the world to come up with a solution to make this into uh, a sustainable bus terminal. Well, what does that mean? So we started using that understanding that there is no such thing as a sustainable bus terminal. There is only such a thing as a sustainable society. So how can we contribute as much as possible to the surrounding areas? So the other... Um, applications to the competition would you know put full of solar panels and say okay this is uh, an energy neutral bus station but instead what we did 
was look at how it can contribute to the areas around it more than to itself. So that is when the, uh, we started using ecosystem services and say the best thing we can do is just maximize its biodiversity potential and then use it as a way also to do stormwater ret uh, retention, urban heat uh, island effect mitigation and so on. And that was in 2005, which you may imagine back in the United States was still very conservative and the word sustainable was only so-so accepted. But because we were able to make a business model that uh, relied on the increase in value of the surrounding properties, because being next to such a wonderful park is so much better than being next to a building that's just full of solar panels, uh, uh, we're able to make a deal so that this become a public park and uh, manage those costs. While the city was excited about this because they didn't have to invest as much into their stormwater infrastructure. So now um, uh, we do develop these plans. We won a competition, which was the largest construction project in the US for the last 20 years, um, started the construction and 15 years later, which is only in 2017, 2018, it opened. And I have a little video uh, of it. Very proud to see this with true biodiversity. There's about 30 or 35 different uh, types of tree species uh, a very irregular use of the landscape to allow a, as wide as possible range of, uh, of animals, insects, uh, microbes, and so on to actually be part of this uh, new urban ecosystem. Of course, it's just a drop in the bucket, but um, it is a big one. And I think it's also an exemplary project around the world of how ecosystem driven projects can really also make financial sense in an urban uh, system. So, um, this is an interesting project uh, that we did for IKEA. IKEA came to us and they said, all right, we have the catalog and we've been to McKinsey and we've been to Deloitte and we've been to two other consultancies and they have done their very best to make it as sustainable as possible, meaning use less energy, uh, less toxic ink and so on. And we ran out of ideas. So. You're not allowed to change anything about the catalog. You're not allowed to change its paper, its size, the volume of its production or how it's made. You, but please make it sustainable. So uh, that's a pretty crazy question. And in the beginning, we really had to think about that. But then we understood that, yes, so the sustainability isn't about that catalog. It's about how the catalog can become part of creating a sustainable society. So we're not allowed to change anything that's in it either. So we can't just say, okay, IKEA, you have to now make it into an instruction book for sustainable living, which was of course, one of the ideas. We also said in the beginning, can you please stop making it? Because you know, not making it is probably the best solution. They said, no, we're still gonna make it. And in fact, it is the most, at uh, that time at least, it was the most produced book in the world by a factor 10 over this number two, which is the Bible. And it was produced every year in 53 different versions around the world. And then we started thinking, okay, so within that supply chain of, you know, getting the wood and going to the uh, factory to make the paper and then the printer and then shipping it to people's homes and then maybe recycling it or something. Um, what exactly here is actually creating all of that impact? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all of this, the, the first three uh, uh, aspects of it, whereas paper itself, the production of paper can be done very responsibly. They were already 100% FSC certified, which is a great job uh, doing that so far. But then they were trying to optimize the rest and they had hundreds of different parameters of water and waste and how they are treating their employees in all of those different printing and uh, paper facilities around the world. And we started thinking, okay, we analyzed the network of how that was produced and where the decisions were made. This is not uh, that map because we're not allowed to show it, but it, it looks a little bit like it. And when we were doing that map, we found visually that everything came together in one place, not the energy and material resource flows, but where the decision was made, who prints it and who makes the paper. 
because that would affect move uh, uh, the, the impact to another place and a different factory, a different supplier would have a different impact. So they had all the power and it turned out to be three people sitting in one room somewhere in Sweden, making the decision on who does what. And they have one week in the entire year to make that decision. So the rest of the year would be to design it, produce it, distribute it and so on. So within one week, they had to make those decisions for 53 different locations, uh, uh, judging from hundreds of different uh, companies. And we found out that they couldn't, they, they didn't have a decision-making tool. So the first thing that we did was allow them to give them a visual feedback decision-making tool that here you can see it, it's anonymized, that within a certain single glance, all of these hundred parameters just with a simple color coding gave them immediately, oh, this first line is much greener than this fourth one. So rather than just looking at individual parameters in the spreadsheet, uh, we can now make uh, much more integrated decisions on a split second basis. They just had seconds to decide on each one of these things. And that already produced a, a 20 to 25% improvement in their decision-making, which had a huge effect on that print uh, run. But we weren't satisfied because we said, okay, that's less bad. It's just what I was saying earlier, but how do we make it actually contribute to you know, the sustainability of society as a whole? What we started to do here was, this is a very powerful overview. You would probably, if you were a print company, you would want to sit behind this piece of software and see what all your competitors are doing, because that's what IKEA is basing their decision on. So what we started to do there is once companies actually uh, joined the process of the RFI, as it's called the request for information to get the information in that this is based on, a complete and automatic sustainability report was generated by the system and sent back to the suppliers themselves. So every supplier that did this, whether or not they were chosen, so hundreds of the world's largest paper and print producers, they would get a full-on sustainability report back and they could also see themselves compared anonymously to the other competitors. So they could see, oh, I'm in the yellow or I'm in the red. And that allowed IKEA to set those on a year-to-year -year basis and move all of those suppliers year by year, allowing them to commit money, millions, tens of millions, to go from the yellow part to the green. Every time they did that, they would be allowed to be in the pool to be selected. If you're in the red, you're out. So that actually manifested hundreds of millions, if not billions of euros in sustainability measures uh, of the entire paper and print industry, which is far bigger than just for that catalog, which is just one of the many, many products that these companies make. So in total, even in the first year, from whatever we could measure and find out from the complex system, we were able to save the entire yearly footprint of the state of South Carolina in, in, uh, in oil energy, just with one little piece of software that we put in the right place, IKEA benefited, the world benefited, and those organizations benefited. And that's, that's just a brilliant way of using systems analysis to find solutions uh, going forward. So I'm um, just going to skip this. This is a lovely project for uh, the world's most sustainable office building, which has an internal ecosystem. And um, really contributes more to the entire environment of the office than just the office itself. So not just energy producing, but also providing energy to the environment. It cleans all the water from the uh, surrounding offices. It produces uh, food and a healthy environment, cleans the air. And that for the same cost, uh, it's slightly more expensive than a normal office building, but being able to get that money back by a reduction in um, sick days of the employees. Of course, six days are very expensive for companies that have a lot of people, which is what an office building is. So this building earns itself back within 10 years on just the reduction in sick days alone. And that sort of uh, uh, aspect is, uh, I think, very powerful. And that allowed us to start developing the idea of catalytic buildings, which are buildings that if placed within the existing city, 
help to increase the sustainability of the whole area at once, rather than just the building itself. So to start taking responsibility of the infrastructure and the complex system around it, and to start contributing to help transfer our built environment towards a more sustainable state, not every building by itself, but neighborhood by neighborhood by uh, uh, using these kinds of principles. From that, we uh, went on to develop the first entirely self-sustaining neighborhoods where region villages uh, and region resorts were the first. So this was one for 200 houses that produced all of its own food, its own water, um, being self-sustaining in uh, energy and being climate adaptive, allowing for different water level rises and climatic conditions being um, bio-based in all of its materials. Mm, then we started taking the next step. And uh, this is a, a project that we're starting to build now. You're getting a little bit of a sneak preview here. So this is not yet published. Uh, in the next couple of months, you will hopefully start to hear a little bit about it. But we want to start creating the blueprints for the first fully self-sustainable, uh, autonomous and um, uh, ecologically powered city districts in the world. It's called Orchid City. And here we combine all of that uh, knowledge and experience to create something entirely powered by nature. So the water that you see here is not just beautiful and wonderful to live next to, which is very important. But it also increases biodiversity, which is very important. It's also the storm water management system allowing this to go up and down and uh, dealing with extreme weather events. It's also the water purification system using bio um, uh, phytoremediation. So all of these landscape actions, uh, uh, um, uh, elements, they have a performative function within the neighborhood and they increase uh, the value, they increase the quality of life, they increase the resilience of the area, dealing with, uh, with all sorts of, uh, of potential changes within the future. And the same way we'll be dealing with the buildings, uh, trying to make them from bio-based sources and combining production, food production, but also uh, uh, construction materials and so on within the neighborhoods uh, to have living areas, to have entertaining, but also work and learning all within uh, a self-sustaining ecosystem. So it will have schools, it will have uh, shops, it has health care, it has senior care. It's not just for uh, people that just happen to be able to, to afford this. Uh, it's uh, socially inclusive. Uh, we want to make the first ones already uh, affordable for uh, median level incomes. And uh, as a concept, it's scalable. So from small community to larger communities, and then we are developing three ones in different climates to show its resilience and adaptability. The first ones in Brazil, uh, the Netherlands and Vietnam. And we are working on the blueprints of these um, uh, to be executed in the next couple of months. Um, yeah, so uh, how am I doing on time, Dora? Do you have a time for one more example? Yeah, go ahead. I think people are having quite a good time and enjoying your presentation, so one Great. more. Um, just show you some pictures. This is our own office. This is one of those self-developed projects where we try to eat our own medicine and get our hands dirty. Uh, we converted this old um, railway uh, locomotive repair station into uh, exemplary, healthy, sustainable uh, listed heritage building for less cost than a normal renovation. Uh, and this is our daily office now. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you're ever in uh, the neighborhood of Utrecht, you should visit. It's also open and it combines all organizations that are working on sustainability and not just ourselves. So we created community to start empowering themselves to be larger than just uh, what we started out with. Um, yeah, so this is the last project I would like to show you, Serenity Farms, which is in some ways uh, a more technical project than we have done, but it's also a project that we've worked for several years with a very large group of people. And I'm, I'm very proud of it. And I'm especially proud of it, what it may become moving forward and what it can initiate. Um, the, the situation here being that of course, uh, for many of you, 
you understand that we have a huge food challenge in the world. That, um, of course, there is a limited amount of arable land that we are rapidly consuming. There is climate change, which is causing that, a lot of that land to, uh, to become less uh, fertile or to be flooded or uh, with erosion um, uh, causing it to disappear entirely. Uh, we have population growth, so we need more. We have uh, unequal food distribution at the same time and this resource distribution. We have nutrient shortages for the fertilizers and we have water shortages all over the world. And that all points to food security. Basically, without food, we're going to die. This is a pretty big thing. Um, the Middle East is uh, really quite an uh, extreme version of this. Uh, so the water shortages are even more extreme uh, within the GCC, which is a uh, uh, combination of the Middle Eastern uh, uh, co countries, uh, where you know, uh, within 20 years, all of the fresh water sources will be depleted. Uh, climate change is hitting uh, even harder with uh, increasing desertification and population growth is much larger than in, uh, for example, Western parts of the world. So here we get something extreme. At the same time, uh, the, um, uh, the, the current fresh food that is being consumed within uh, these countries is flown in through jumbo jets. You have to understand that every tomato or strawberry or cucumber that you eat within Saudi Arabia or uh, the UAE or whatever comes in through a cooled air airplane and has cooled trucks driving everywhere. Uh, and once it lands in your plate, it's probably nearly a week old, which means it's far from fresh and the shelf life is very short, which causes a lot of it to be wasted. It's also expensive. So people that are not that rich uh, they don't have that many options to eat fresh food every day. So it also has something to do with social justice. So what we decided to do is say, okay, the only real um, solution to this is we need to produce food locally and no matter what. And we cannot use water from the aquifer. So we don't have sweet water, potable water. We can't use that. And we also shouldn't use energy because, well, we have so much energy from the sun that should be possible. So we set out on this challenge on creating uh, a, an agricultural system that uses only salt water, in this case from the Red Sea, which is very salty water, 40,000 ppm, and also only solar energy year round for year round production for all fresh food uh, that, uh, that we could produce. And it was a very difficult challenge, but we managed uh, to do that and also feasibly. So the different systems that are here uh, are used in uh, uh, quite advanced climate control, um, uh, using water purification systems, growing energy management, distribution, packaging, uh, and also including education and, and, and management on, to make sure that this happens. And here you can see a comparison between the normal distribution line from distribution abroad, production distribution abroad, then going through the airplane, you can see the enormous amount of, uh, of CO2 that's produced, which is all captured by uh, what's called Serenity Farms, which is the CO2 footprint of this line is 3000 tons of CO2 per kilogram of food versus 10. So that's a more than 350% um, improvement over uh, this line, while at the same time it increases the quality of the food, it increases food access, it reduces the risk for the countries because, hey, the airplanes can't fly anymore, or there's a, a, a supply chain uh, breakage, and then suddenly you have a food shortage, so it's shorter, it's more resilient, it's more autonomous for the countries and societies, and it's more socially inclusive, also creating high quality jobs, um, in the meantime, that are local for, uh, for a wide range of, uh, of people. So here you can see how that complexity thinking starts to actually permeate in our physical designs. We don't have one solution to distill water, for example. We have several different types of systems that are using in conjunction and that can capture each other depending on the situation, the products that are grown that can change over time, 
the different uh, uh, seasonal conditions, whether or not we need more or less cooling uh, or uh, we need more or less water for uh, this type of plant and that type of plant with uh, this kind of composition. So uh, we are trying to aim for creating resilient solutions even when we are reliant on these uh, high-tech systems uh, to go uh, forward with that. So here's some of the products that come out of it. Um, strawberries are even possible. And for those of you that know, strawberries are cold weather plants from the mountains, they like the cold. So growing strawberries in 50 degrees Celsius in barren uh, uh, desert landscapes, uh, that's really fantastic. And uh, uh, we, we hope to, uh, to see that uh, and eat those first strawberries soon. Um, here you can see the uh, Knowledge Education Center. Uh, that's part of it, where we try to show, uh, you know, what's the origin of, of food? How do these ecosystems work? And also, we don't think that this mechanical type of solution is the end, end solution. We know that it's one step along the way. We have another principle called polydome, where we create an internal self-sufficient ecosystem within uh, a controllable environment. Uh, that is just too advanced for investors to get into now. First prototypes need to be remade and so on. So what we do here is we try to already get people ready for the step after this, uh, understanding that this solution, which is great and I, I love it, but it's still only one step along the way of trying to uh, achieve a truly sustainable uh, food production system. So I'm just going to skip, skip these. I'm going to end on this slide. Uh, with the statement of you can do the impossible if you try. And I hope uh, this gives you a little bit of, a, uh, of an insight into uh, yeah, the variety of different projects and how we use systems thinking and analysis. I haven't shown you that much of our working process, but I, I hope you understand from the first part. Um, yeah, so maybe you have some questions I'd love to hear. Thank you, Dan, that was brilliant. I think most of us are sitting here just going, Oh, <laughs> okay, can you come and do this for us in our neighborhood and, and hoping that <laughs> you will come along. Um, and you do this with obviously partners and, and suppliers, but you have 15 people in Exap. So uh, imagine what you could do if you had much more people. <laughs> well, we used to be uh, bigger at some point. Um, and then also I have to say that I personally found that quite difficult because if you have a lot of people, um, it becomes more about volume than it becomes about quality. Mm. And we understood that the difference between having 100 people and 15 people to the world is not very large. It's mm -hmm. basically insignificant. But if the quality of each one of our projects is high and we can still try, I mean, we still sometimes need to take projects just simply because we need to pay the bills. We have no funding externally except from our projects. Uh, we wish we had sometimes, but yeah, uh, that's just the case. But mostly we try to take every project, even if a client isn't really there yet, to take them along and to show them really what is the benefit of taking those three, four extra steps. Mm -hmm. Because something that I have realized very is a, an absolute truth within this whole process is that if you do try to do systemic sustainability or integrated sustainability, however you call it, if you try to do it a little, just do a little bit here, just to, then it will cost you more. It will become more complicated. The risk to it will increase, but you won't really get that much benefit. But if you go the, the whole way and you use it from that integrated perspective where you try to reach ecosystems, biodiversity uh, uh, benefits, as well as cultural, economic, uh, health and, and um, uh, and well-being benefits while being energy neutral and whatever, if you go all out like this, very often you get so many added benefits from them together that your business case, your financial business case, but also your value business case becomes so much stronger that uh, it becomes a much more profitable project. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we've been able to show a few times, not every time. I mean, we, you know, I'm sure that many of you work in the sustainability area. You know, you walk against so many walls, you have to get up and try again and try again. That's the reality of it. But once every so often you break through 
and you, you realize it. And then we only need a few of those example projects to pull so many others along with us across the bridge. Uh, and that's what makes it worth it for me. Yeah, that, that sounds really interesting. And, and the, uh, people are, are applauding your, your philosophy on, on what it means to, to grow in quality instead of, uh, instead of volume uh, necessarily. Um, just a, a housekeeping note that we will finish uh, the official part, uh, meaning that we will stop also the, the YouTube sharing um at half past so that's about in three minutes so uh but we if people are interested uh, can can stay on afterwards uh so yeah there have been questions so uh marta was for example asking like how do you define the system boundaries uh when you are defining your your sustainability the way you do yeah that that is um an, a very important question uh, that doesn't have an easy answer mm. Uh, it is, of course, your system boundaries is one of those aspects of systems thinking that can, it can really bring you to your knees. You can discuss about it forever as well. The way that we deal with it is at the beginning of a project, as much protest as we may get from some people within the team, we don't set any of them. We look at the world at large, at society at large, the world is our system boundary, the universe is our system boundary. That kind of forces us that in our bottom-up approach, I mean, it becomes almost immediately impossible. So it, it, it almost forces you immediately to start looking from a complexity perspective and start understanding that everything is absolutely connected. So your first challenge is to start understanding the behavior and the particularities of that system. Once you start identifying those and you start seeing rough contours of perhaps what that place is like or that situation is like, and then you start coming up with you know, possible ideas of intervention and so on, that's when we start formulating, okay, that, that could be a scenario. So then we take that scenario and then we start going through the bottom up and saying, okay, first we put the system boundary here for example, around its uh, uh, around its supply chain, from you know from from mine from cradle to grave, uh, that's where we start, and we we won't look beyond that, and we you know we we look closer to the first degree, and we look a little bit less close to the second degree, and so on, and that's kind of manageable, and there's a lot of these you know supply chain uh, management tools that help you to to define these. But that's really kind of interesting where from the top down, you, you don't have a hard system uh, boundary, whereas from the bottom up, you do, then those also start interacting with each other. Because at some point when you start seeing that if you increase your system boundary, you increase your solution space, and it's not just more work and more complicated, but it also increases your ability to find something that may, maybe not directly, but indirectly, result in something great, then that becomes a challenge to try to push those limits uh, to a larger uh, system and while also being uh, effective and uh, within the time frame that you do have to look at uh, the projects in enough depth. Then there's other projects which are very, you know, very rigid, uh, you know, that, uh, for example, that have to do with uh, uh, the GRI, where uh, the global reporting initiative, where we have to constrain to particular standards, and then yeah, we do that uh, uh, life cycle assessment standards and so on. But we always have that complexity versus uh, reductionistic perspective in mind when we do it. I hope that kind of satisfies the answer. Not sure if it does, but mm. I can also talk about this for a very long time. Yeah, I hope Marta is satisfied with that with that answer. Okay, so just to show the last uh, bits of the slides uh, that we have uh, for how to stay in touch with us, either uh, Systems Change Finland or the Systems Innovation Community. Very quickly that there will be another Toolshed meetup at the beginning of May, uh, which is dealing with climate education and systems change. And uh, a middle of May, an open space gathering for people that are interested in changing systems and be found from our website as well. Uh, you can become a member 
of System Change Finland uh, details can also be found through the website. Okay, so uh, I will call this uh, the end of the official part. And uh, I would also like to just confirm with you, Tom, that if we don't get through the list of questions, is it okay if I send it through email and then uh, we can get the answers back through that way and share it with the, with the slides? Great, thank you. Yeah, for sure. uh, and I actually uh, would like people to, to ask the questions that they have posted. So if you are able to, to unmute yourself, feel free to ask your own question. And it would be Vishnu next uh, about designing portfolio of interventions. Hi, Tom. My name is Evelyn. I am calling from Finland. So uh, one of my question is about the, uh, well, two questions. So I know that your focus is about the sustainability, but could you bring some examples what has been the impact for, from uh, past projects? So if you have. The impact of past projects? Uh, mm -hmm. well, In the future, so. Have you oh. identified some impact of the uh, in the future from past projects? Um, well, um, that IKEA project was very influential for a number of years. And what is really great about it is that the systemic effect of that sustainability measures of those uh, all of those printing companies and so on keeps rippling through. Uh, where the IKEA catalog itself has stopped production. So the, 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 we use the IKEA catalog as a, as a boat to load systemic change and systemic change started to become implemented and becoming part of the race, which has now been adopted by different uh, uh, parts of the IKEA organization to use the same kind of approach. And now the boat was no longer necessary and so uh, the, the, the catalog itself disappeared, which is it's just great. It's, it's incalculable what the effect was of that. Uh, for some other projects, for example, San Francisco, uh, the Salesforce Park, um, that one I think mostly has, uh, I mean, it has a local effect for its biodiversity and for its water and so on. But I think by being you know, the winner of one of the largest competitions in the United States, it, it was usually exemplary and it's still constantly quoted as an example of, hey, ecosystem services can be done in one of the most expensive real estate realities in the world and you can make a business case out of it. So there, I think the, the, uh, the pioneering aspect of the project, the fact that it's so visual and, and tangible is one that, that, that permeates through what we hope to achieve with Orchid City is that we are doing something that has never been done before. No one has ever tried to build a neighborhood like that before that is also affordable and really at scale, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. And what we really hope to do is to make it a new normal. I hope that in 10 years time, that is the new standard for uh, plants going forward. And the whole idea about Orchid City is also to share all the data and the way that we've done it open source, just like SID is open source. And that sort of stuff, just from the very beginning mindset saying, no, we're going to share all our knowledge because we don't want to make money by keeping solutions to ourselves. We want to make money just you know, uh, by, by getting paid for the solutions that we create. Okay, but let it move forward. Let it systemically ripple through the system and then it becomes detached from you. It creates a much longer viable life for that solution to, uh, to be implemented. And um, I hope that's something that, that we can achieve. So, so working on, for example, reducing uh, the amount of patents on, on important sustainability solutions and working on that sort of legal structuring is so very important and has such a strong systemic effect within society that that should not be underestimated. Uh, but I get ahead of myself, uh, future effects. I think maybe Thank those you. were some examples. 
Hopefully. Thank you. Very nice for uh, the points that you have uh, brought. So the second question, sorry. <laughs> so the second is about the, have you uh, done some projects about the, uh, let's say, jobs of, of the future? So currently in the world, so we are having many layoffs. So have you, uh, are you in a project or have you done a project related using uh, system thinking for that kind of social issue? For social issues, yes. Uh, so, for example, we've been supporting, it's a totally different organization, but it has the same name. It's the IKEA Foundation, which is the NGO that gets funded by IKEA to mostly work on what's called smallholder farms in Africa and India. Uh, there, it's about agricultural livelihoods, is how to create yeah, sustainable resilient systems within the communities, for example, in Kenya. Um, and their system thinking has really helped to increase the idea that uh, just giving people uh, advice and counseling and seeds and, and, and materials to, to do that will only really work if there's also top-down change happening from uh, the organizational structures uh, that these people are part of. Uh, and understanding that whole complexity of dynamics between the different layers from where they are and all the other people in the network to expand and to empower the way that money is used to help people. So to change from a more, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a typical example of giving people fish versus um, teaching them to fish. And I was thinking it's a bit of a basic uh, uh, comparison because Fishing goes a lot better if you're not hungry. So perhaps first give some fish and then uh, help to uh, uh, fish, but also then help to make the production systems to make the stuff that you fish with and, uh, and so on. So to have a more of what we call a ecosystem approach to funding rather than a project-based funding. And with that, we've developed a new program called uh, Systemic Investments that we hope will change from impact investment, I don't know if some of you are familiar with impact investment, to go from impact investment, which is a great first step already, but to go from impact investment to systemic investment. So you look at the systemic change that you create, you don't just fund one or two projects that then have a beneficial impact, but you, you invest in a systemic change that may have a lot of little moves and some larger ones in order for a whole societal system to be able to get over that hill and, and then allow it to change itself. So you don't have to pay for everything. You have to pay for that transitional dynamic to go over the hump. And that's where we get into system dynamics and, uh, and uh, change theories, which, which are very interesting, but that, that's another lecture. Uh, but yeah, I hope that helps a bit. It helps, thank you. Uh, yeah, Dora, if I may go next. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, all right, uh, thanks Tom for the wonderful presentation. Uh, this is Vishnu from Bhutan, a small country in the Himalayas. Uh, hi to everyone. Uh, my question was uh, with regard to designing the system, uh, systemic design, while, uh, while we are designing a, a portfolio of uh, intervention as a practitioner, what are some of the critical things that we should be mindful while designing the portfolios of intervention? And with regard to that, uh, as, as Tom has rightly pointed out that it has a cause and effect, uh, uh, that uh, causal effect uh, relation. So how, as a, what are some of the evolution tools uh, in terms of uh, 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 assessing those uh, cause and effect uh, effects uh, in, the, in the systemic uh, 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 portfolios? So just wanted to get uh, your views on that. Over to you, thanks. Yes, thank you, Bishnu. Uh, also, advanced questions. Uh, I don't have all the answers. I know that there are different ways at approaching what you uh, are referring to. And there's a few different toolkits that, that all I think can contribute something useful. I think that's something useful to be able to look at whatever dynamics there are and social feedback systems. I think now, I think uh, already from the early 60s, the tool of causal loop maps have been returning over and over and over again for decades on end. They can be a little bit hard to understand, 
but they are so powerful. All you need is a whiteboard and a bunch of people and you know, uh, stick to it. There's some, some, there's some little useful software types, but it, I, I personally feel just works better on paper. So um, one of the tips that I can give you is, I know it's difficult with Corona now, but hopefully within uh, a couple of months or maybe a year, we'll be rid of it. There's a tip, put very different stakeholders in one room and do it for several days at a time. Because working for two or three hours on a problem like this isn't enough to make your head spin up, absorb the information that's necessary and come up with something. You need to do it several days at a time. And I think you also need to do it not by yourself. I mean, it works. It's great if you can do it by yourself, but then see that as a breakaway session in order for you to then come back to a couple of other people and reflect with them and make sure those other people are very different to who you are. So if you're all from the engineering department and you all love Star Trek, then maybe you need to find some diversity uh, uh, within your team. And I mean, there's nothing against the engineering department or Star Trek, but you know what I'm, I'm trying to say. So diversity in your team and concentration in time, turn off your phone, get all the information that you have prepared. So the way that we do it is we work for a few months in collecting information that is in four or five different categories. So we collect precedents, which are great examples or bad examples. We collect stakeholder information. Who are we affecting? Who matters? Uh, where are those people? We connect trends and market data for the business models to make sure how does that work? And we collect data about the reality. So, we, uh, for example, if it's a place that maps uh, climate data, uh, uh, interviews with people, uh, that's part of the stakeholders. And then we kind of, you know, we, we just hang it around the space to, to be able to soak ourselves into it. And in the first half day or something, people are just sharing that with each other to make sure that everyone is aligned. And then we start going through the process to set a goal and to start analyzing. Uh, and we do that then iteratively. That's the third one that I recommend. Don't go from one week uh, doing your analysis, then one week trying to find a solution, and then the third week you do evaluation. That's not how you should do it. You should do the first day, you should do all three in a row very quickly, because then you kind of know what the scope of the project is. Then you go back and then for three days, you do one day of goal setting, one day of solution and whatever. And then you start over again. And then for the remaining two and a half weeks, maybe you spend you know, four days on one, four days on whatever. By just doing three cycles, these iterative cycles, you have a vastly improved understanding of the whole of it, rather than going through it in a linear fashion. So summarizing multidisciplinarity, put it in a room, concentrate it in time, and do iterative cycles. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Anil had a quick question about whether you're aware of Proteus. No, uh, I, I, I don't think so. I suppose it's another, another framework or tool for, for systems thinking or designing, but if Anil could write more about it in the chat or I can uh, look uh, more into it later. Uh, and then, Noor, if you would like to go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, it was brilliant. Uh, really, I, I really appreciate it. My uh, question is, uh, may we have um, an example of what you call a small project? Uh, what was the mission and what was the budget so that we can see if you only um, especially for us from the south <laughs> sides are different yeah sure i would love to by the way i see people mentioning also some digital tools yeah we do definitely lots of online co-creation these days miro is our tool that we use most of the time but yes nor uh, that's an interesting question um, yeah, our project ranges from things that just last a few days to things that last a few years. But I have one of my favorite little projects that I think is very humble, but with a beautiful result. Um, not every project turns out like this, but, but, 
but the intention is um, I, when I was a student in the United States, I, I, I studied in a, in a city called New Haven, uh, which is in Connecticut. Um, and there was a little restaurant in my street that was owned by uh, a man that was half Chinese, half Japanese. And his mother had created a sushi restaurant called Mia Sushi. It's still there. And uh, Mia Sushi, he was taking over from his mother and he wanted to do it differently because he was from multiple cultures rather than just Japanese. He also, for example, was already training. He was using his restaurant to train uh, illegal Mexican immigrants to become a sushi chef because it's a very valuable profession. So he was using it to make his social change. He was already buying uh, all of his uh, 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 produce uh, very sustainably. He was very uh, conscious about all of it. And then he sat down with me one night because I love to eat there. We became friends and he asked, I want to become the most sustainable sushi restaurant in the world. Can you help me? And so the budget was maybe a thousand euros. Uh, we, we spent a bunch of days together. It wasn't all that much. Um, but what we did in our analysis is, first of all, you know, get together with the goal. That goal is want to become the most sustainable sushi restaurant. Now, if you remember what I said earlier, there is no such thing as a sustainable sushi restaurant. Because if you just have the moon and you put a sushi restaurant on it, the people in it are going to die and uh, nothing's going to, you know, so in and off by itself, that doesn't work. So what sushi restaurant, what can a sushi restaurant contribute to the rest of the world? Now, the things that he was talking about were putting solar panels on the roof and making his own vegetable garden. And those are all great. But if you really look at the analysis of a sushi restaurant where its impact lies, it's in the fish that it buys. That's not going to be a surprise to any of you, I'm sure. You know, um, uh, fish stocks are dwindling. And this was 50 years ago. And that was already clearly a problem. There's also heavy metals in a lot of fish. Uh, so it's not necessarily always that healthy. So there's, uh, there's that challenge. So we looked at him and said, like, yeah, we're going to have to do something with the fish. He said, yeah, but that's the essence of sushi. How, how am I going to do that? I, I already ordered the most sustainable fish that I can buy. What else can I do? It's like, well, maybe those are less bad. But what fish can you eat that is not less bad, but more good? And that's an interesting perspective. And we started pulling back from this. And we started investigating what animal can you eat that would be good for the environment? It's an interesting question. Well, there are, and those would be invasive species. Species that don't belong there and they're damaging the ecosystem. There's a bunch of them. And we went to a nature uh, conservatory conservation uh, agency and said, okay, can you give us a list of all the invasive species in the area? And it's huge. And we were able to go through it and go through all the fish and say, uh, and other things, which ones can we eat? And some of them you can eat, but people don't. So, okay, let's have a look at that. And then basically what it turned into is that we, we made a, a new menu that only had those invasive species. And so we created a sushi restaurant that only used invasive species where the fish used were not just less harmful, but actually contributing to the conservation efforts that turned into a way where he could actually pay fishermen who would catch them accidentally, but also to be able to go out one afternoon and just fish that one. In fact, you target, for example, lionfish, which is a tropical fish, which is very beautiful, but it's a total uh, murderous maniac. And it goes around uh, killing all sorts of other fish. So we got fishermen fishing for lionfish, which is normally not eaten, and then normalize the eating of completely different kind of species. Well, as a result of this is, yeah, he went from having a small restaurant in, and he didn't want to grow big with his restaurant, which is also nice, but uh, the New York Times selected him as the best sushi restaurant on the East Coast of the United States. He was on the front page of the New Yorker magazine. He got his own television program. Um, that news about eating invasive species then started to run around the world. And now it is a bit of a thing. It's not yet very popular yet, but 
um, the consumption of uh, uh, invasive species as a way to both help nature and to feed yourself is now a thing where you can find many other restaurants and places in the world doing it. So that had, I think, a big effect for just a couple of days work, just, you know, a thousand euros and uh, some good company. Is that a nice example? I think that's a fascinating example. Nori, you are no, muted. Yep. Yes, it's a fantastic example. But as you said, it was uh, more something that you did by heart than uh, you did by business, I mean. That's all of our projects. We are not making any money. I can tell you that. Uh, you know, so we try to make do with uh, what happens. Some small projects, we can just spend a couple of days and make people really jump ahead uh, a lot and they can do a lot of it themselves. And in some projects, yeah, we, we get lucky and there's a big organization that can actually afford to pay us for, for a couple of months of work. But most of the time we get, we don't get paid. If you want to earn money, don't become a systemic sustainability consultant. It's not a good idea. Don't, it's not going to make you rich ever. Sorry. So thank you for not only for uh, the presentation, but for what you do. That's appreciated. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. My, my love goes out to all of you here. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here if, if making money was your objective. Well, making money can be a nice side thing. And we have made a lot of money for other organizations. But usually it turns out that the making the money part comes afterwards and it's very difficult to prove that it will. So as a consultant, it's a difficult position. Also as a small organization in the Netherlands, you know, uh, how, can you, uh, how can you prove that? It, it requires decades of proof and, and we're getting there. So that's how, if you wanna help, for example, if you know any investors, send them our way because we really need them to do things like Orchid City, to invest in it so that we can realize these cities and neighborhoods, which can all have a little restaurant in it that uses uh, uh, invasive species, you know, and maybe some of your inventions as well. So if you have great, uh, real great inventions that you think can help us to build those cities, then yeah, let us know. We need all the help we can get and all the partners we can get. Thank you. Uh, ben, would you like to ask a question uh, about environmental performance data collection? Hi there. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so my question was about the um, IKEA example that you run through. Um, so as I understand it, the software that you produced had um, basically some environmental performance data from each of the suppliers. Uh, now, I've done a little bit of work at the NHS um, in the UK and um, as a big organization, you have the opportunity to really influence the supply chain with your co with contracts. But the the kind of the issue with that is getting that sort of data from smaller companies because they might have to do an LCA themselves, which is very uh, time and cost um, primarily and costly. Um, so I just wanted uh, wanted to know how you sort of went through that process and how you managed to get some data from those organizations. Cheers. Yes. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, that wasn't all our work. Uh, we, we worked with uh, uh, Deloitte, uh, who was already engaged, as I mentioned, Deloitte and McKinsey were involved before we got in and they had run basically into a stalemate and not being able to prove anymore. Uh, but Deloitte became, uh, remained part of the process and they used uh, a system called uh, trade extensions. And uh, that was a piece of software that's already established out there that can help with RFIs. So um, uh, managing that process. Um, but uh, the essential part of it is that um, there is a RFI process, which I know you're, you must be undoubtedly familiar with. Um, and then uh, what we did was uh, we asked for only the basic and fundamental data that allowed us from IKEA's perspective to do the calculations on what impact it had so that it remained reasonably simple for the organizations uh, and putting basically the consultancy cost into, uh, into IKEA. Um, so that had two advantages. One of them, it's much easier to audit 
because you're just looking at how many waters did you use, not you know uh, how much, how many square meters of uh, stormwater runoff capture area did you compensate for? You know something like that. So it was also easier for the suppliers to participate, which means that more suppliers did participate, which was in the end beneficial. Uh, third of all, uh, uh, they get less questions from their suppliers, and it went a bit faster because they needed a very rapid RFI cycle. It's just a month, which is pretty crazy. And uh, so that was on. 284 different parameters. So that's a lot. And I actually have to say great respects to IKEA. I mean, if is there anything that I really dislike, it's going to an IKEA store. It's like, if it's my worst nightmare, but uh, the IKEA organization, even though they aren't really talking all that much about their sustainability program, and they still have a lot of improvements to make, don't get me wrong, but it was really quite noble with what they did and how far they had pushed this whole uh, uh, process. And I think a lot of organizations can learn from what they did. Uh, so if you wanna know more about that or, or, or something, then, then yeah, get in touch. The, the IKEA thing is also quite well documented on our website and there's a couple of articles floating around. So maybe that's a good read for you. I hope that answers your questions a little bit. It's a broad subject. Yeah, that's great, thanks. Um... Yeah, that, that, that about covers it. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I understand your pain. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult to be able to sort of like, because if you if you can start to influence the cyber supply chain like that, that's when so much change kind of, yeah. that's, that's that systemic change that you were talking about. You can really start to um, influence things like that. But, but the, takeaway, the takeaway here, I think, is that for the NHS, it doesn't cost any money at all. I mean, almost immeasurably little, especially in the medical field, to create an automated process that sends back a sustainability report from the data that you got. That's really not all that difficult. And it helps all those smaller organizations, usually because they can't afford to have those analyses done, but the NHS can. So mm. use your centra centrality and use the fact that you're not very flexible and you're not, you know, but you're usually connected and you are very large and powerful, use it to your advantage and say, okay, we're going to do this top down thing that helps all these bottom up changes from happening. So you're creating a feedback loop through the information that you're already getting. You're not taxing them in any way. You're not asking more hours for them to invest. You're not making it more complicated, but you're giving them something that allows a realization and maybe even do what Ikea did, organize this race where every year you move the mile, uh, the mile post, which is, we call it a self, uh, self learning supply chain. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Tom, for that answer, detailed answer. Um, I'm just conscious of the time you promised two hours to spend with us uh, and the two hours is up. Uh, there are a couple more questions, but then uh, as we agreed before, then I will try to uh, send it in email and then add it to, to the recordings. And uh, uh, I'm really, really grateful. Uh, it's not just that you said okay to when we approached you uh, to, to uh, be involved with this tool shed, but you were quite enthusiastic right from the beginning. So that's a big, big thank you, Tom. And as the others have said already, the, all the work you, you do, and I'm sure that you have scored quite a few uh, fans now and, and we'll, others will follow your, your work and we'll get in touch. And hopefully uh, many of us are, are inspired uh, more than, than we thought we could be after this session. So thanks you so much. And, and thanks everyone for, for participating and, and sticking around for, for all these two hours. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. And anytime, Dora. So uh, if you leave me back, then just let me know. <laughs> well, it might. It seems like that there would be a, an interest to, to have another session, but we'll have a have a think about that. And uh, yeah, I would also like to point out that uh, Tom was talking about their their um, open space. Oh, sorry, open source uh, materials and uh, the Future Lab platform. And then it will be Udemy. You were saying. Uh, that will carry future, your courses. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So people, if you are interested to, to learn more, go ahead and, and check out those, those courses. So with this, I will end this toolshed meetup.
Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a nice week. <laughs>